I knew it was a problem when I had a day where I didn't have to get anything done. Uh, I didn't have any, I didn't have any plans. I didn't have any, I wasn't hanging out with friends. Yeah. Literally from the time I woke up Saturday to the time that I went to bed, I just had my laptop open the whole day. Yeah. And that was when I got through an entire day and I was like, oh my God, I wasted an entire, I could have been hanging out with friends. Yeah. I could have been out, like, I could have been outside. Yeah. And I wasn't. Braden, thanks so much for being here, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's awesome. So before we kind of dive into it and really get into the discussion, I just want to know a little bit more about you and, and who you are as a person and yeah. kind of your background, what you do, what you like to do for fun. Just kind of dive into it. Let's hear it, man. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Braden, and uh, I'm the owner of Look Like You Lift. We're cool. an international personal training company. We focus on strength and getting people to look like they lift. That's awesome. So um, been doing that. been doing this for 10 years, Sweet. and uh, for fun... Well, it's snowboard season right now, so I'm boarding a lot. We're awesome. actually going to be hitting up Powder Mountain today. Perfect. So, That's awesome. Yeah. That's way tight. That's It's me in a nutshell, dude. Awesome, man. So how long have you been doing strength coach and, and nutrition? Strength and nutrition for 10 years. 10 years, right on. So what kind of got you into that? So I was always really the small kid. Okay. I was a small kid yeah. working on a farm, and like everyone could throw more bales of hay than I could. So right. I got into the whole uh, trying to get stronger out of high school. Got into powerlifting, fell in love with that. But I, what I found was I fell in love with helping people more than seeing my own transformation. That's awesome. So I started diving into that. I went to school, uh, paid a lot of money to work with uh, some inter uh, internships. Cool. And then uh, went into competitive strongman. Had an opportunity to work with some of the strongest men in the world. That's and, awesome. Uh, it, yeah. So I learned a lot from them. Um, took what I took what I learned and then uh, just grew it into into what we have today. We help people. All over the world, we have 300 clients right now. We got four coaches, um, so yeah. When it comes to nutrition and, and strength coaching, really, kind of, how does porn touch on that? How, why, you know what I mean? Like, why are you here? Why did we invite you here? Why is this important to you? So, in my coaching, what we find is the fitness and the nutrition side of things yeah. is actually pretty easy. Yeah. Right, but the mental side of things is a much harder battle to fight. And right. what we find is that. Uh, a lot of these people come into wanting to get fit, lose weight, and get healthier um, as, as kind of like the, the, the catalyst for starting a better life. And yeah. then when they actually get into it, they're like, oh, I want to start working on maybe quitting porn. Oh, okay. you know, maybe stop drinking. Yeah. Right? So these things are all – it snowballs into uh, just an overall healthier person all around, right. not just looking, looking good on the outside. Yeah. And it works both ways too. If I can get you to – fix your issues with pornography and, yeah. and break that addiction, all of a sudden you have more energy and more social energy that you go do other things with your life. Totally. All of a sudden you become a more useful person. So it, it's kind of, syner it's synergistic. Totally. Um, we have a lot of our, our clients who, because we're so transparent of our stance on pornography, yeah. which is actually pretty rare yeah. in the fitness industry. Totally. They finally feel comfortable about talking about it. Yeah, and I just had a great. conversation with a uh, with a client uh, a couple of weeks ago who, this is he started crying on the phone because this is the first time he's opened up about his problem. That's awesome. He was um, you know sexually abused by his religious leader all like all through his childhood, and that led into a pornography addiction. This yeah. is the first time that um, he's been open to 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 open up about yeah, it. Yeah, him great. losing fifty pounds and getting off his blood pressure medication. That's cool. Yeah. But what was really excited for me totally. is to see that he's like finally ready to take this next yeah, step. Yeah. He's taking that transition, right? Yeah. And making it serious. That's awesome. Yeah. In in your experience, what how do you make them comfortable enough to talk about that? In a funny way, we make just make light of it. Okay. Yeah. And this for is sure. what I love about fighting the new drugs. Yeah. Like your shirt, the have a nice day. Uh huh. Right. It's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. It, it it allows for us to have a conversation about it. Totally. You know, and another thing about fight the new drug is your anti shame. Yeah. And we can't have conversations if we're if you feel bad about it. Like, totally. This is a whole new thing. We're yeah. kind of the pioneers, the generation that's kind of figuring this out for the first time in history. Totally. So we just kind of make light about it. Um I always just wear the shirts around the gym, wear the yeah. shirts on on my videos and people are like what, what does that say? Uh-huh. 
stop looking at porn. Why are you telling me to stop looking at porn? Uh -huh. like, you know, so yeah, just kind of making light of it and just making an easy conversation is a really easy way to get people to open up. Yeah, about it. that's great. When in your experience, do you think that there's a lot of shame around it and around with the, the people, your clients that you work with? Do you think they have shame around the subject? hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and I think it's due to partially, we still don't quite understand it, it is still totally. so new. I mean, yeah. Internet pornography has only been around for 15, 16 years. Yep. Um, and so we're still kind of figuring it out. Uh, totally. Whereas with like alcoholism, there are great support communities around it. Totally. But I think we're still kind of missing that um, in this uh, in this field. Yeah. So when, when you're talking with them, what, what do these conversations look like? What, when you're talking about porn and you're talking about your overall health and your overall fitness, what, what do these conversations look like? What are you talking about with them? So it usually starts out like, what's the deal with your porn thing? Yeah. Like, uh -huh. like what, 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 what are you, why are you telling us to stop looking at porn? Yeah. That's usually how it starts. And then we kind of open up and talk about, uh, from a scientific base, from a psychological standpoint, um, it's, it's not good for you. And it, they were like, Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Can I see the studies on this? And then, you know, luckily I have my little library of studies. I can just send the resources to totally. that. Um, and then the next conversation is, so why is this bad for me? Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that. Like, so how's your social life right now? How's your dating situation right now? A lot of the guys that we work with are coming out of divorces or bad relationships. Yeah. Again, that's another catalyst for like, okay, I'm going to get like a revenge body. Yeah, totally. Uh -huh. um, but then they find out that at the heart of it, there's something a little more serious that's holding them back from being more social. Yeah. Um, and so talking about, all right, so here's why it's a problem. Here's how it's affecting your life right now. Yeah. Now we can have a conversation. How do we fix it? Totally. Right. And that's kind of where it's out of my wheelhouse a little bit. Yeah. Uh, all I can do is really guide them to resources. I think Fight the New Drug has a great resource course um, that we direct a lot of people to. Awesome. Um, so we kind of we kind of steer toward the pros here. But sure. uh, I all I can do is like share my story and how I was able to fix it and like and offer my support and my accountability along the journey. Totally. Yeah, that's great. Do you open up often to your clients, I guess, then when, when they ask you about porn and they're asking why you why you say not to watch it, do you ever get into kind of like your side of it and why it's important to you? Or are you focusing more on like kind of the, the science and the facts? I'm an open book. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do both. Cool. Uh, but, and, I'll, and I'll do both not on just the porn side, but like the nutrition and fitness side. Yeah. I'll use my story as well. Yeah. And I think it's a powerful thing to do. Like it, it's, it's one thing to share the research and to yeah. share the studies but i think it's another thing to share your story and it, it's more motivating when you can do that totally you're more human when you can do that 100 sense that connection right yeah, yeah. 100 totally that's great that's awesome um talking about that and, and your story a little bit what what is your story with porn how did it affect your life and and why did you think that you know it was time to make a change yeah so um it all started i was first exposed to porn when i was about 10 years old yeah yeah and I grew up in a fantastic home, both loving parents, um, very religious parents. Yeah. And I think they didn't quite understand how to have the conversation of sex. Totally. Yeah. It's hard, huh? It's hard. Uh -huh. It's hard for yeah. parents. So I don't, I don't hold any blame or like yeah. anything against them. Totally. But as a child, you, you're, you have these questions, you're figuring your own body out. And yeah. so you're not getting the answers from your parents. So where do you turn? Turn to online. Yeah. And that's where I was exposed to it. And, um, it, it became a plague on my life for yeah. a long, long time. I was more afraid of the wrath of my parents than I was about actually talking to them about the problem that I had. Interesting. Right? It was yeah. more, I was more ashamed of the issue that I had. And so totally. I kept it to myself my whole childhood Yeah. as opposed to like actually coming out and talking about it. Yeah. There's that stigma, right? It is. Yeah. And it's cool. hard. Yeah. It's hard. It's and difficult. It's, it's difficult for a child too because the child knows it is wrong. Uh -huh. But yeah. how do I talk about it? Yeah. Yeah, they don't have the words to bring it up. They don't know yeah. where to get started or, or how to have that conversation. Yeah. yeah, so I hope that's one thing that like we in this generation can bring to our children yeah. is how can we have this conversation? How can we talk to our kids? And if they have a problem, how yeah. can we make sure they're in a safe, again, non-shame environment that we can ha let them know that they're loved and they're comfortable and they're safe totally. and we can talk about it. Yeah, for sure. I think that's key. Yeah. Yeah, when there's that stigma around it and, and, and there's that shame, it really is hard to open up. And it's like you said, you don't want, you're more afraid of the wrath of your parents, right? And and them finding out than you are about the the potential harms. And, and you don't even know about the potential harms when you're that young. Right. Yeah. Well, and your parents, pro my parents probably didn't even have a no, didn't even know it was a problem. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> like uh -huh. a 10 year old looking at porn. Like, no, you think of like when a someone looking at porn, you think they probably back in the early 2000s probably still thought of it as like, uh, 
the, the magazine. Yeah, the Playboy magazine. Yeah, or something right. Yeah, but yeah. like online porn was so new back then. It's a different game. Totally different. Yeah. Game. So yeah. again, I don't blame them at all. But totally. Um, so yeah, that was basically my whole childhood yeah. and I could tell that it affected my relationships It affected my whole dating scene when I was, when I was a teenager. Really? Yeah. Um, how so I objectified my dates. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. I was kind of a scumbag. Yeah. Um, and I, I truly believe it was due to the amount of porn that I was consuming on a totally. regular basis. Yeah. I saw dating as, as opposed to, uh, so instead of seeing dating as an opportunity to grow relationships and to experience love, dating for me as a teenager was how can I get in someone's pants, right? Uh-huh. How how can I recreate these things I see on t- on the online? Totally. Um, and so like even just bringing this out, like I actually really regret that. Yeah, I really regret that. And yeah. it wasn't until like I was like twenty four, twenty five when I finally accepted that this is an issue. Yeah. Finally took the steps to get through it. I personally used the fight the new drug resources at the time. That's awesome. They were fantastic. Um, yeah. When when did you notice it becoming a problem, and and did you notice it becoming a problem outside of your dating life as well? I knew it was a problem when I had a day where I didn't have to get anything done. I didn't have any. I didn't have any plans. I didn't have any. I wasn't hanging out with friends. Yeah. Literally, from the time I woke up Saturday to the time that I went to bed, I just had my laptop open the whole day. Yeah. And that was when I got through an entire day and I was like, oh my God, I wasted an entire, I could have been hanging out with friends. Yeah. I could have been out, like, I could have been outside Yeah. and I wasn't. Yeah. How long have you been looking at porn before you kind of realized at that point, like this is affecting me and it I need to do something? It was at least 12 or 13 years. Yeah. It was yeah. a long time. Yeah, totally. So, and I'm, and there are people out there right now who probably have been doing it longer than me. I, I think I got lucky yeah. of cutting it out earlier as early as i did totally yeah. yeah i mean it's something that follows you kind of forever right yeah. it's a struggle it's yeah. it turns into an addiction it's yeah yeah it's rough for sure um when you were younger did you do you think that if if you had the like if you were if you had the environment with your parents to feel comfortable talking about these things do you think that it wouldn't have been an issue for so long 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. yeah and i reflect on this too because we got a kid coming on the way so like we're we're constantly thinking about okay how can we how can we make sure that we have something set up so my little boy doesn't go through like what I went through? Yeah. Right. And I know for a fact that if I was, I know for a fact that if I wasn't concerned about the wrath of my parents and saw them as a safe space yeah. and like as a 10 year old, 11 year old, Hey mom, dad, I'm looking at this stuff. And instead of being afraid of like, you know, getting punished for it, coming to them and like, all right, let's get this fixed. Right. If, I think that was something that I really needed as a child. Yeah. And, um, if I got that, we probably wouldn't, well, I would probably even want to be on this podcast right now, but, right. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, we're glad that you're here. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> Not under the circumstances, but we're glad that you're here. Yeah. hundred percent. So yeah, I think it was totally necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think in that moment, do you think that there is another adult that you would have felt comfortable talking to in that moment or friends that you would have felt comfortable talking to? Or do you think that the the stigma around it and the shame was so intense that, that you couldn't open up to anybody, even the best friend or, or something like that? Nobody knew. Yeah. And I can't think of anyone of mine in, in, in my life ever that I could ever be comfortable enough talking about it. Yeah. You know, and that's one, that's one thing that I'm trying to do with my platform. Yeah is to be that person that someone can be comfortable to talk about it, right? Yeah, that's great. Because uh, I didn't have that. Yeah. How did you become comfortable talking about it? That, did it take you a while to become comfortable talking about it? I mean, obviously, it's not an overnight thing, right? If it no, took it's not. years of, of struggling, then... It, it took a while, but I finally... There, there came a point where... So <clears throat> I'm going to use um, our business as an example again. Yeah, so uh, when someone has the goal to lose weight, I need to lose 50 pounds, most people will try to do that in silence. January 1st, they kind of just make a goal inside their head. Yeah. What's the likelihood of them accomplishing that? Probably not, right? Probably not. So one of the action steps that we have in our coaching program is day one, they sign up. Day two, I want you to tell your family. I want you to tell your friends. I want you to tell your colleagues. I want you to send them the text. We have the text written out that they're going to send out to them. That's awesome. And this multiplies their likelihood of success. Totally. Because now they have other people that are going to hold them accountable. And then just subconsciously, they're going to 
hold back on some things that would they know that would impede their ability to to do it. So because I was I was a pretty big name yeah. pretty early on, and so I knew that hey look I can't be the only one here struggling, so I'm just gonna just blast it out there. And I was I was freaked out. I was like I'm gonna lose business. I'm gonna lose friends. I'm gonna lose followers. Totally right. But I did it, and what actually ended up, ended up happening is I had a circle of fans who were like, I'm so glad you opened up about this because I've had this same issue. And it was it's all the same people. Like, yeah. Same thing. Like They've had it for 15, 20 years. Yeah. Found it as a child and never talked about it. So that was kind of cool to see how many people came out of the woodwork when yeah. I made that announcement. Yeah. So You created that safe space for them to feel comfortable enough to talk about it. I took it upon myself instead of me trying to find the safe space. I created it for somebody else. That's awesome. So, yeah. That's really awesome. I love that. Did you, I mean, when, when you kind of realized it was a problem, what, what were your next steps? How did you go about it? Did you open up about it? Did you, did you kind of deal with it in silence for a while until you realized you couldn't? What was that process for you? Yeah. So I actually tried for a long time yeah. and, uh, I, I did do it in silence and that doesn't really work. No. I think being accountable to other people is kind of the key to getting this job done the right way and fast. Yeah. Um, but some of the things that, so I turned to stoicism, uh, really early in my life. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually what I wear here, but, That's awesome. um, stoicism essentially was a philosophy that made a lot of sense to me. And one of the things that the stoics, talked a lot about is um uh remembering your death mm. okay we're all gonna die yeah you're gonna leave this earth and so when i started meditating each day on i could leave today this could be my last day on this earth all of a sudden when you when you have that conversation of this is my last day on this earth i'm gonna spend it watching porn like that's it's it sounds really dumb. It does, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, just honestly, just meditating on like this. Uh, my time here is so finite, and time is the most valuable commodity that we have because you don't get it sure. back. Yeah. You're really gonna spend that watching porn. Yeah. And you don't have to answer that. Like, your values are your own. But uh -huh. like in my own life, there are so many things that I could much rather be doing with this finite amount of time that I have left. Yeah. So I think that was really big for me to like finally take accountability and like take a grasp on the severity of this. Yeah. Not even just from like a mental and psychological and uh, social standpoint, but just from a philosophical time standpoint. Yeah. I'm wasting time doing something that I could be doing something else. Totally. That was like really big for me. Yeah. So yeah, it's that it's the wanting to better yourself and wanting to to have a better life, right? And, yeah. and do more with your time and, and more yeah. with what you have. That's yeah. great. So I think one action and tool that maybe other people can use, but like one thing for me was whenever I got that urge to just like pull it up, you know, pull up a tab or whatever. This is my last day. I'm leaving today. Is this the best use of my time? And then right off the bat, like your room's probably dirty. Yeah. You're going to get your answer, right? Yeah. Your yeah. room's probably dirty. You can probably go out, get an exercise. You probably make some food. Yeah. Hey, go call somebody up. Like, go on a date. Yeah. So. Get I, real connection, right? Real connection. Yeah. Don't get it from a computer. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's great. Um, when when you did kind of take that step, where were you with your current wife? Were you with her when you kind of realized that this was a problem? Was it before you met your wife? It was before I met my wife. Um, it kind of wasn't fully resolved until about one or two years into our marriage. Yeah, for sure. Um, we're all good now, yeah. but it's still like, it, it needed to happen. It needed to get addressed and it needed to be fixed before I met her. Yeah. But I think it was finally over when in the middle of our marriage. Yeah. So, and she was a big uh, proponent of helping kind of like finish it off completely. That's I awesome. had to open up about, about it to her and she was very loving and understanding of the whole situation. So, That's great. um, yeah. And I, I don't think, uh, we would have finished this job completely if it wasn't, if it wasn't for her. That's so, awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Again, it's that connection, right? It and, is. Yeah, it is. And it's so important. And it drives so much. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Do you, do you still see the effects of it in your life today? I do. Yeah. Um, the the unfortunate reality of pornography is it's going to be in your life for the rest of your life. Yeah. But it is your choice of how you handle it. And how you deal with it. So yeah, you get temptations. Those are never going to go away. Yeah, you get urges. Those are never going to go away. You find yourself alone and internet is around us all the time. It, that's never going to go away. No. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to improve? 
you know, how are you going to set yourself up so that it's not a problem? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't want to lead anybody astray and make them think of like, oh, well, once it's fixed, it's never a problem ever again. Uh-huh. Alcoholics have to deal with this the rest of their life too. Totally. Right? Yeah. But the way that you fix this is you become a better person. Yeah. That's great. I yeah. love that. It's the self-accountability as much as it is to other people. 100%. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's really great. You said that you wear your shirts, your fight shirts all the time to, to the gym. What got you to that stage of being comfortable enough to to display that, right? And to wear a shirt that says stop watching porn and to put it on your Instagram and, and you're a content creator, right? So like you said, your audience is big and it matters. Right. And so what was that final kind of push, I guess, that made you be like, this is important to me. This is kind of what I want to stand for and, and I want people to know. Yeah. Honestly, it wasn't as hard as I think a lot of people think. Yeah. Because fight the new drug shirts look really cool. <laughs> <laughs> they have really cool designs. We try to make it easy for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So I just wear them because they look cool. Yeah. But then, uh, so it makes breaking the ice so easy totally. when people come up and they like have to squint and like see what the actual text is on the shirt. Yeah. So it really wasn't hard for me to do that. Yeah. Um, I loved the shirts and I loved the message. And so I, I wear them with pride. I I promote the organization with pride because it's really not that hard for me. That's awesome. I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, do you think, so like in, in your kind of gym culture, right, and your your strength culture, do you think that um, that it's becoming normal to kind of speak out against porn and to understand its effects and its harmful effects? Or do you think that's still the norm right now and there's still that shame around it where it's just not talked about or maybe it's not looked at in that light? It's interesting because in the in the fitness industry, yeah. it's also it's more so pornography is seen more so as an jo- as a joke. Yeah, everyone accepts that they just look at it and they just kind of like play on it as a joke, like it's okay. Got you. Um, that's the that's the angle that I think everybody takes. We take the different angle. Yeah, we make fun. We we don't make fun of it. We make light of it so we can have a conversation and not have any shame around it. Yeah. But at the same time, we we address that it's not okay. Let's yeah. have a conversation about how we can fix it. Yeah. Instead of like just kind of playing around with it yeah so yeah it, that's it's it, it's interesting like like what i was saying earlier it's it's very rare for what we're doing so in our in our community how much do you think that it it helps with your overall coaching how much do you think it affects your clients on and what impact does that make do you think i think it makes a huge impact um i went into this i went into growing this business with the with the goal of creating better men yeah because this world needs better men and the heuristic for doing that was simply just getting you stronger, getting you a 400 pound squat. Right. But, um, that all, that always seemed like that the job wasn't complete. Yeah. And so bringing this extra piece of here of, of resolving your issues with pornography, I finally feel this is the direction that the business needs to go. Um, this is how we have a lasting impact. If I can't get you strong enough, I can't get you to lose weight, but I can help you with your pornography addiction. That to me is a win. Yeah. You know, if that's the only thing that you get out of our content and our platforms is that, that to me is a huge win. That's awesome. So, yeah, I, I can tell that you really actually care about the impact that you're making on the people that you're working with and that, that that's what matters. And I, I, think- I care about, yeah, I care about my guys a lot. I mean, we have over 220,000 people around the world who follow us and like that, that that's cool. But I, I care about, I, I care about those men and fixing their issues and becoming again just better men in general yeah whether it's getting stronger whether it's losing weight or fixing their issues with porn or any other kind of addiction that to me is like a huge i think that is when i when i had that moment of realization that's when i finally figured out my purpose here that's awesome. so yeah that's awesome so kind of touching back when you said that you uh were struggling and, and you kind of, you know, realized that this was a problem and you, and you wanted to address it. You mentioned that you, you went to fights resources, which mm-hmm. is awesome. How did you find fight? Um, and along your journey kind of, was that, you know, kind of your education point or, or did it just kind of pop up? It was actually really early. So, um, let me think. 2012. Yeah. So 2012, the porn kills love. Yeah. Yeah, um, the iconic. Saw, yeah, the <laughs> iconic shirt. So I saw I saw someone wearing that shirt, and I was like, "That's cool." Yeah. And so I just I went online, "Porn Kills Love," and Fight the New Drug popped up, and I was like, "What's this all about?" Yeah. So, I mean, but like, so I found found you guys really early on. Still had my issue yeah. until a few years after that is when I was I knew that that was the resource I could turn to for help. That's awesome. Um. So I think that's the kind of impact that you guys have is like 
planting that seed and however long it takes for them to finally come around for resources for help. Totally. Yeah, it's just the education part, yeah. right? People don't know about this problem, and so... Right. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. So, yeah. And you can't be blamed for that, right? Right. Yeah. Totally. So, that's great. Why, if, if you were along that journey, right, and you hadn't made that kind of final step yet, why did Porn Kills Love resonate with you? Why did you see that and think, like, I want to look that up? Because I knew at that time, I knew that I didn't know what love was. Because, again, it was around that kind of dating scene, getting out there, being a bachelor. And I had no idea what love felt like. Mm. You know, you have the love of your parents. But yeah. Like, love with another human being. I didn't know what that was. And I didn't know that porn was connected to that. And I didn't realize that porn actually can, in my own opinion, I think porn desensitizes you to feeling other emotions for other humans. So... That was why those three words resonated so much with me because I was like, oh, wait, is this my problem? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. When, um, you know, when you were looking and you were like talking with your wife and you're about to get married, I guess before that, um, did you think that it was necessary for you to stop watching porn and to deal with that problem before you got married? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So a lot of people, they think that, hey, if I just get married or if I just get a girlfriend, this problem goes away. That's not the case, okay? Because I've had friends who do have this addiction and they do get married with that notion. Yeah. And two of them who have had that those thoughts, they're divorced now. Yeah. So fix it before you – it's – that's not – that's not you, – you have to address the issue with the issue at hand. It's yeah. not going to like – magically go away once you have another connection with another person totally you're just running the risk of hurting that person more yeah so yeah. i think i think a lot of people think that you know why they watch porn is because they don't have a partner right, right. and they don't have that love connection and so they just assume that when they get a partner it goes away it, it goes away right and it doesn't because really at the end of the day what they're dealing with is so much deeper on mm. a different level Right. And, and it's a bunch of other things that they're personally dealing with. And so they think that somebody else can just kind of cover that. Right. But right. but the porn sues them. And so they need it. And so they just keep continuing to consume it. Right. Yeah. And so and it, and then they fi figure out that, you know, like I can't I can't stop. Right. Yeah. Well, and then it becomes even worse when you now have this new person in your life and you are spending your own time and your own energy because it takes a lot of energy to do this stuff. Yeah. Right? You're, you, you're wasting your energy on your own selfish needs as opposed to giving that energy into someone else. Yeah. So, yeah, it goes so much further than that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I kind of want to go back and maybe touch on shame just a little bit. Yeah. Um, do you think in, in your mind kind of how does, how does that aspect of shame around this kind of subject and just shame in general affect your client's mental health and, and their journey with strength and nutrition? Well, you're not going to talk about it if you have shame around it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this goes for anything in life, any other aspect of life. If you're shameful about it, the likelihood of you talking about it is very, very low. Yeah. But once you can accept that this is not normal, but like this is a problem and there's other people around that can help you. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you feel safe to talk about it. You're much more likely to not only talk about it, but to get help for it. Yeah. You know? And I think that's like why Alcoholics Anonymous is so fantastic because there is that community there that camaraderie uh, and i wish that we had more resources like that today around like totally. por pornography and on yeah. or something yeah so, right a little pa <laughs> a little pa yeah so yeah. um but that yeah so uh shame if we can abolish the shame feeling then yeah. this this becomes so much easier to bring to light yeah so when when did you realize in your life that um that it was okay to break that shame and it was okay to speak out what kind of made you realize that it was in the fight the new drug resources yeah. um talking about like not being shameful we we don't we're an anti-shame movement yeah um and i was like oh man that's cool yeah. like that's really cool and that was when i was like i don't need to be shameful about this yeah there was a psychologist that also it kind of kind of blew my mind um he said we are the first generation that has to have to deal with this problem yeah you know, with other issues that we've had, other epidemics that we've had, we have a track record of history that we can look back and see what's worked. Yeah. So along your journey, you said that it was hard to talk to your parents and you felt like there would be kind of more repercussions if you did talk to your parents about it. Right. But once you've kind of gotten to this point where you are now, have you felt comfortable enough to open up to your parents about your past experience? 100%. Yeah. My parents and I are very, very tight. Uh, 
my relationship with them is fantastic. And I think leaving the home was probably the best thing for us. Oh, okay. Um, but we, we had had conversations of my childhood, how they raised me and like, what, what are things, what are some things that they could have, could have worked on? Yeah. And again, I don't hold any shame against them or anything because totally. they were doing the best they can. Yeah. More so I, I asked these questions to them so I can do the best that I can. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing was, um, like the punishments, the anger, the, the rage and the, again, the kind of the wrath of my parents wasn't necessary yeah. and there should have been a safer environment to have these conversations. Totally. Um, so yeah, we're, we're on great terms and they have, they, they have noticed that like they could have done th- some things better and I use it so I can learn how to do things better for my own, for the next generation as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's great. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad that you're able to talk about it now and feel open enough to, and I mean, and I, I know it's hard. It, it's kind of a different story when it's your friends or your partner and, and you have that kind of intimacy, but there's always that level of kind of maybe, I don't know if it's like respect or what for your parents or you don't want to let them down. Right? Yeah. Well, and it's, it's tough. Again, I got really, really lucky that yeah. my parents and I are in the position that we're in Yeah. because a lot of people don't get to have that. So totally. I'm, I'm very lucky. Yeah. 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 For you along this journey, obviously you're a coach for strength training and nutrition. So obviously there's a lot of science that goes into that and, mm-hmm. and it's important because that's kind of the core basis of, of how to get started, right? So right. I think, is that kind of what resonated with you about fight maybe or and, and the problems with porn or? The irrefutable science showing the issues with the brain yeah. and with the, um, and the, the social implications and the social implications of pornography yeah. and the trafficking that is fed by the pornography, holy crap, all of a sudden this became way more reason to stop. If anything, right. like the fact that your viewing of pornography is feeding into the sex trafficking world, that alone should be like reason enough to stop. I think a lot of people think that this is a moral issue mm. um, when in reality, right, where there's science backing it, there's facts backing it, and then so many personal accounts of people's own stories in the industry or, or their own struggles with it. Um, it's so much more than that, mm. right? It has it has an impact on individuals, relationships, society, and, and really... Um, it really it's just it's more than a moral aspect. When when you did finally kind of get to that process where it wasn't a problem in your life, right, or, or it wasn't a daily problem, it mm-hmm. was kind of what were the the benefits that you saw in your daily life, um, whether that be like on your personal or if that if that fed into your relationships or. It's gonna sound really cheesy. I would love it, but <laughs> <laughs> things were colorful. That's awesome. I saw like the world more colorful. Yeah. Like it's, it sounds really cheesy. No, it, it opens your eyes. And I, I like, I started to feel more. Yeah. Um, I, I told you that earlier, like in my whole dating bachelor scene, yeah. I didn't know what this concept love felt like. Yeah. And I think it's because pornography kind of doles your emotions. Yeah. Um, when it wasn't a problem anymore, all of a sudden I knew that I could have a greater capacity to love. I could have a greater capacity to feel, yeah. to feel happy, to feel sad. I didn't feel numb. Yeah. So things just like had more color. Like yeah. just, I could just feel more. Yeah. Um, That's great. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like going through life wearing like mittens and then <laughs> taking those mittens off. And then all of a sudden you can like feel yeah. sand and water. And it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's just, an, it was an interesting transition. And I hope that people who, take these steps to stop, get to feel that because they will feel it. Yeah. And life is a lot cooler when you can experience it to the greatest of your capacity. Yeah. Um, that should, and I hope that motivates them to stop. In your conversation, uh, when, you know, when you're with your clients and you're meeting with them and you bring up porn, do you get a lot of backlash? I do. Yeah. Not amongst clients, oh, more okay. so around, uh, because the clients already feel safe and comfortable with me. Yeah at that point. Yeah. But I do see a lot of backlash on social media. Yeah. You know, when I make a video talking about why a non-religious person doesn't believe in porn, uh, that video got a lot of backlash and it's from people who will say they use it to strengthen their marriage or like bring spice to their relationships or it's not an issue. Yeah. And like we, and they're blaming the religious zealous for anti-porn or a big one is anti-porn equals anti-sex. Yeah. And it doesn't. It does. I love sex, man. Uh-huh. Like, and it's better without porn. So it, there's nothing more pro-sex than being anti-porn. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So yeah, I do get a lot of backlash, but I don't really, I don't care because I yeah. think my message is stronger than anonymous, 
um, anonymous messages. And if anything, at least I've planted that seed yeah. that for those people who don't think it's a problem that in the back of their head, at least now they can think that, Hey, maybe it is a problem. Yeah. That person years ago said that it could be a problem. At least I've opened up that door. Yeah. So yeah, again, you don't know what you don't know, right? When yeah. you were a kid, you didn't know that it was going to be harmful and you didn't know it was going to impact your life for kind of the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. And so I think I do. I agree. I think it's really important to kind of just plant that seed and let it grow and yep. see where it goes. One hundred percent. All right. So thanks again so much for for being here and for kind of sharing your story and going into yeah. it. What What's the best way for our followers to support you? I don't need. I don't need much. <laughs> I, I I can't. I can't think of anything. Uh, really. Sorry if it doesn't really. No, you're good. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw you a follow or a like. What, yeah. yeah, shout out your pages. Give it a little yeah, shout out. That's yeah, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. Look like you lift on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, man. That's great. Yeah. Thanks so much again for being here. Bro. I appreciate really it. Yeah, appreciate thank you. You're great. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thanks again for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.